I'm really glad that I get this opportunity to speak for Kashmir uh, in front of, uh, you know, all your guests, all your esteemed guests. I would like to uh, straight away start talking about uh, whatever I've gathered, whatever I've experienced, uh, uh, the kind of questions that had been coming to me uh, from international forums and gathering all of that understanding, I would like to begin. Uh, I totally get that the argument against abrogation of Article 370 from Kashmir stems from your concern for human rights in Kashmir. And as a Kashmiri, I totally appreciate your overwhelming concern for our rights. But be rest assured, truth be told, the government of India is doing everything it can to protect the rights of women in Kashmir who were living in a society that crossed all limits of patriarchy and entered the zone of radicalism. The government of India is doing everything it can to protect the rights of journalists, the government of India is doing everything it can to protect the rights of politicians in Kashmir, like Abdul Ghani Lone and Mirwais Farooq Shah, who were assassinated in broad daylight just because they resisted being forced to remain in a state of war with India when they clearly supported the idea of democracy for the Kashmiri people. Be rest assured, dear people, that journalists and social activists like myself and many more flag bearers of Indian nationalism in the Kashmir Valley will keep bringing to you the truth which we've been suppressed from telling during the three decades of proxy war before the Article 370 was finally abrogated. And when it was finally abrogated, what did the valley look like? I'm sure what you heard is that it was blood soaked, there were screaming women, there were barbed wires everywhere, but no. Unfortunately, uh, for those who tried to set this narrative, that wasn't the case when the abrogation of 370 actually happened. There were children playing in the parks, shops and schools were open, people felt a sense of relief like never before. When weapon dealers like Yasin Malik and Asya Andrabi were detained and then imprisoned and they continue to be in that state, they are still imprisoned. But we feel free, free from being judged for loving our Hindu brethren, free from casteism, free from discrimination, free from hartals. The only lockdown that we saw since the abrogation was in the COVID pandemic. The downside of abrogation, however, remained the internet shutdown, which also was successfully restored after completing necessary national security checks and balances. In the political front, we look forward to upcoming and impending elections in which participants from newly formed parties like AINP, uh, Jammu Kashmir Workers Party, etc., prepare to contest after bypassing the stringent dynastic politics that used to exist prior to the abrogation. I'd like to assure everyone on the panel that the Indian government has been successful to a large extent in stopping Kashmir from becoming yet another Afghanistan, where women are suppressed for their rights to marry whoever they choose to, and where minorities from religions other than Islam are harassed, tortured, or lynched. The Indian government has successfully been able to stop Kashmir from becoming another Pakistan, where girls from minority communities are forced to marry older Muslim men, or where one sect of Muslims, namely the Sunnis, are free to violently attack other subsets of Muslims like Shias, Hazaras, and Ahmadiyya Muslims. 